looks like we're live. Um, let me just go ahead and share this on my um, Facebook page here, and we'll get started. Uh, wait for everybody to join here as well. Let's see. <clears throat> Let's make sure the um, hopefully the audio is working. I had that one time it stopped working. All right, there it looks like we're on here. Let me just get this shared. Share now. Cool. All right. Cool. Well, we're all set. Um, let's see. Can I go big screen? There we go. Cool. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, we'll give a minute. People are still joining here. But um, my name's Stephen Morrison. I'm here to talk about my uh, book, Shall I Remonker in Plain English? See if it focuses here. Yep, there we go. Shall I Remonker in Plain English? Um, came out about a month, two months ago. Gosh, yeah, I guess two two months ago now. Um, I figured it'd give some time for people to read it, um, kind of get an idea about what it's what it's about. But um, yeah, we're just gonna talk today about the book, um, share a little bit of thoughts about it. I'll probably read a section from the book for a little bit here, um, and then if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below, and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, anything related either to um, Schleiermacher or Bart, um, or really anything with the old Plain English series, series or um, uh, just general questions about Schleiermacher. Ne not necessarily have to um, have read the book already, but just in general, if you have any um, questions or um, concerns about Schleiermacher, I know he's a kind of difficult figure to discuss. Um, he is quite challenging and um, not the most popular guy either, but um, I really had a good enjoyable time reading his work, um, really liked studying him as a theologian, and um, really happy with this book and how it all kind of came together and worked out. So, stalling enough here, we'll um, get started here. I'm going to go ahead and start, um, I'll read a section in the book, um, and then let me explain a little bit more about why I'll be reading this section in particular. Um, so I'll be reading from the introduction of the book, um, a little bit where I talk about um, Schleiermacher and his relationship with um, Karl Barth, um, who obviously, if you're very familiar with some of the relationship between Barth and Schleiermacher, it's quite strained. Um, it's not typically, um, he's not typically somebody that people that read Barth will typically read Schleiermacher as well. Um, so it just kind of gives a little bit of that background history, um, goes a little bit into Schleiermacher's critique of Bart, which is um, the main thing I actually wanted to talk a little bit about and share from the book some of those sections. Um, and if there's any questions as we go along, feel free to let the um, type them in and we will um, get to those at the end. Um, but yeah, so I'm reading from the introduction. I'll read this story here about um, a couple pages here just about Bart and about why we should read him and a bit about his critique. So. Um, my theological education has been dominated by Karl Barth, so it should be no surprise to learn that the first image I held of Schleiermacher was that of an enemy, before ever reading him for myself. What led me to write this book? The previous titles in the series on Barth, Torrance, and Maltman follow a Bardian trajectory, so it may seem out of character for a Bardian to turn his attention to one of Barth's favorite opponents. But the first thing I learned about Schleiermacher was that he can be, and perhaps must be, appreciated from the Bardian perspective. The truth is, Bart's theology has more in common with Schleiermacher than he dared to think possible, though he hoped it might be true. And Bart owes a lot to Schleiermacher's perspective, far more than he was willing to let on. There are still a lot of things they disagree about, certainly, but there are far too many convictions they share to ignore. So we should banish every every suspicion of Schleier, Schleiermacher as Bart's enemy. At the very least, their relationship is far more complicated than it appears at first glance. But this is not a book about Karl Barth, and I only mention him for two reasons. First, because my own experience with reading Schleiermacher has been so decisively shaped by Barth, much of which much of what I had to relearn about Schleiermacher was a correction of what Bart of what Bart led me to believe about him. <clears throat> 
Second, because this is probably a familiar story for many theology students. Barth's enormous influence over 20th and 21st century theology has led to Schleiermacher's neglect. So by turning my attention to Schleiermacher and examining him, and examining him from the Bardian perspective, it is not in the sense that I will repeat any of Barth's criticisms of Schleiermacher. On the contrary, I hope to overcome the damage his critique, his critique has done to Schleiermacher's name. So Bart's critique. Bart's stance against, against Schleiermacher particularly and liberal theology generally was summarized best in 1924. Quote, one cannot speak of God simply by speaking of man in a loud voice. End quote. This polemic exemplifies Bart's early theology and it sets the course for much of his later thought. Bart sought to do theology again from the basis of God's word rather than, rather than human intuition. For Bart, Schleiermacher's theology was little more than anthropology in disguise. That is, he saw Schleiermacher's God as the projection of human feelings in the echo chamber of empty subjectivism. subjectivism. Schleiermacher's doctrine of, of the Trinity is another major point of criticism, particularly its placement in the conclusion of his dogmatics. Bart takes this to mean that the Trinity has no constitutive significance for Schleiermacher's theology. In contrast, in contrast, Bart wished to give the Trinity a place of controlling and determinative, and determinative importance. In other words, Bart believed Schleiermacher's doctrine of the Trinity was non-essential to his theology, included merely to offer lip service to the appearance of a truly Christian dogmatics. Bart argued that Schleiermacher had constructed a philosophical subjectivist theology that failed to be thoroughly Christian, but only Christian in part. The doctrine of the Trinity was added only as an afterthought, as nothing more than a Christian mask to cover up a philosophical speculative core. All things considered, however, Bart never thought of himself as Schleiermacher's absolute enemy. In contrast with Brunner, who famously set fire to all, his, all the books he owned by Schleiermacher after publishing his own critique, Bart considered Schleiermacher a brother and lifelong conversation partner. He always, quote, tried to be a loving student and not an enemy. End quote, and never thought of Schleiermacher as a heretic. He even praised Schleiermacher, saying, There has never been a systematician in modern times like Schleiermacher. He knows the beauty of theology. The rest do not. End quote. Just a few years before writing the Epistle to the Romans, Bart stood before his congregation in Safenwill and, and called Schleiermacher one of the deepest Christian thinkers of all times, full of devotion to and understanding of Jesus. End quote. His polemic was not a hostile attack, but above all, it was one of respect and admiration. To, the, to this day, on the staircase of Bart's residence in Basel, a portrait of Schleiermacher hangs in a place of honor, and a bust of this great theologian was ever watchful in Bart's classroom. It is clear that Bart greatly admired Schleiermacher, despite his fierce criticisms. Um... Yeah, I'll read this as well. Terence Tick, an outstanding Schleiermacher scholar and translator, once met with Bart to discuss his relationship with Schleiermacher. He recounts the conversation. And this is a long quote here. So, quote, One day after I returned to Switzerland, we had been talking for some time in his study. It's referring to Bart. I told him that despite the differences in what I regarded to be his serious misreadings, he of all the theologians since Schleiermacher was Schleiermacher's truest heir and had overall been the most faithful to what Schleiermacher was trying to do. At this, he racked, rocked back and forth in his chair, and for some minutes loudly laughed and laughed. After a thoughtful pause, he said, with great earnestness, I would wish that to be true. I hope it is. Then he spoke again of his love for Schleiermacher, of having, been viewed, of having viewed him dialectically in, in the light of modern trends traced to him, of his regrets, of his critical positions having become softer in tone, of his wishing for a chance to talk it all out with him in heaven, and it's perhaps and it's perhaps being too late to go back and try again. That others must do that. End quote. Why read Schleiermacher as a Bardian? For Bart's sake. Bart's relationship with Schleiermacher was profoundly ambivalent. He, exp he expressed, expressed a great appreciation for Schleiermacher, praising him as one of the most significant theologians since Calvin, yet he was also one of the most fervent critics of his work. Bart would be disappointed to learn <clears throat> Bart would be disappointed to learn that so many Bardians refused to even read Schleiermacher, let alone give him a fair reading. <clears throat> 
Schleiermacher is, of course, well worth reading in his own right. He was a brilliant, influential man, and his multifaceted contribution to theology is enormous. But the idea that we cannot appreciate Schleiermacher if we also appreciate Bart is false. Bart would fiercely disagree with such a dichotomy. It will also be helpful for us, helpful for us to recognize two critical conclusions uh, scholars have reached. First, Bart and Schleiermacher have more in common than often thought, as we've already noted. There are, of course, irre irre irreconcilable differences between them, including sharp disagreements over Christology, the Atonement, the Trinity, the divine attributes, and scriptural authority. But many of their core convictions are shared, such as their dedication to placing Jesus Christ at the center of theology, their emphasis on divine grace, their ethical commitments, and their non-speculative approach. Second, and perhaps most important for our study, it has been, it has been well established that Bart misreads Schleiermacher. Both Schleiermacher scholars and Bart scholars have recognized this. Bart's interpretation of Schleiermacher's theology as a subjectivist is as a subjectivistic and humanistic construction is a poor misreading. This book is my attempt to offer a reevaluation of Schleiermacher from the Bardian perspective. As such, one of my primary aims is to overcome the plethora of misunderstandings that, surra that surrounds Schleiermacher's life and thought, many of which come from Bart. And so, like I said, if you're just joining in, this is part of the introduction from my book, Schleiermacher in Plain English. I'll show it here. Um, but that was just part of the introduction, um, a really important part, especially, um, like I said, in it coming from the Bardian perspective, Schleiermacher is often seen as kind of the villain of modern theology. He's often kind of perceived, um, almost it's almost just given as a fact that Bart was correct about Schleiermacher. And so it leads to a lot of neglect um, of Schleiermacher's really significant ideas and his significant contribution to theology. Um, it really just kind of gets downplayed and looked overlooked um, because Schleiermacher admittedly is quite difficult to read. He's a challenging thinker. Um, he really is a quite a dense writer, so you have to read his works a few times to kind of really grasp them. Um, but because of that, and because add the contribution of Bart and his popularity that kind of makes Schleiermacher have a bad name, not that Bart was the first one. Before that, Schleiermacher had already kind of been known um, in a negative sense. Um, but anyway, so combining those two things, it makes sense why people kind of disregard Bart and kind of ignore his legacy, even though he is arguably one of the most significant theologians um, after Calvin, um, after the Reformation. He's really a significant thinker, um, really has, a, um, has done a lot for theology today. Um, and a lot of the trends and the modern movements of theology are um, significantly influenced by his work and his theology. And so it really is a shame that he's not read as much as he should be um, because he, he did have such a significant um, impact. And a lot of, um, I forget who it was that said this, but it's a pretty well repeated fact among um, Schleiermacher scholars that uh, Schleiermacher is, um, um, he, he's still our contemporary. He's still somebody that we um, have to wrestle with. He's not somebody in the past that's been done away with. He, he has extreme relevance for today. And so I think part of my heart in the book was really to recapture that, to recapture his relevance for today, and to do so particularly from the Bardian perspective, um, particularly from um, kind of that overcoming that negative approach to his work and seeing it kind of in a more positive light. And um, it surprised myself to discover that, to discover how positively he can be read and understood. Um, but it continued after, you know, after I just kept studying, it, it turned into something where I really do can say today that I appreciate Schleiermacher and um, very highly value his uh, contribution. And so with that said, um, I wanted to go in a little bit and talk a bit more of like how I think, how I particularly think um, Bart's reading of Schleiermacher is uh, misguided, um, and the, go in a bit more of the specifics for that. Um, obviously, I have quite a long chapter that digs into the controversial issues such as Schleiermacher's the feeling of absolute dependence, um, the claim of subjectivism, and all of this that uh, became quite popular after Bart. Um, but I just wanted to read a little more, one more section from the book that kind of explains and articulates quite well 
um, a, the correct way to understand um, Schleiermacher's theology against the um, trend to read him under Barth's um, um, influence. And so I do want to note that Bart, while Bart popularized, popularized the um, subjectivistic reading of Schleiermacher, um, and it kind of became the standard because of Bart's popularity. Um, he Bart was a bit more sympathetic to Schleiermacher than some of the critics that came after Bart. Particularly, Brunner is a good example. Like I said in this intro, Brunner burned all of his Schleiermacher books. Um, almost, you know, he published his own critique of Schleiermacher, and he kind of cleaned his hands of him, and um, never wanted to deal with him again. But Bart Bart remained a, a humble and a lifelong student of Schleiermacher. And so, like I wrote in the intro, it, I think he would be um, quite disappointed to find out that so many um, Bardians and people that really like Karl Barth's theology would discard Schleiermacher. Um, he would want people to read Schleiermacher. He almost always taught a class on Schleiermacher, and he um, he considered it essential reading for doing theology today, um, especially his great work, The uh, Christian Faith. So I'm going to read that section, like I said. Um, so the issue that I'm contending with, in case you're unfamiliar, is is this idea that Schleiermacher has built an entire theology from below, from the ground up. So the idea that um, God is nothing more than a projection of our human intuition, um, our feeling. Um, and so that's the big um, kind of caric caricature that that um, Schleiermacher kind of gets pigeonholed into. Um, and it's difficult to find somebody that has a good reading of, reading of him. Even though modern scholars tend to do pretty well at this, um, but people that don't really study Schleiermacher tend to fall into the same patterns and just accept Bart's criticism as fact. Um, so anyways, well, I'm going to read this section here. Um, see how much of it I actually read. I'll probably stop half at a certain point here. Um, but this is just a better explanation of what I think is an easier way and a better way to interpret particularly um, the feeling of absolute dependence, but mostly um, in general Schleiermacher's methodology. Okay, so this is in chapter four of my book. So, for Schleiermacher, dogmatics is a reflection on the highest stage of human self-consciousness. But if, re if we recall from the previous chapter, self-consciousness is not a consciousness of the self, but that consciousness which arises out of the self, the self in relation to another. Then what is the highest stage of self-consciousness? -con for Schleiermacher, it, it is the feeling of absolute dependence. Ultimately, this means the very same thing as being in relation with God, and it merely describes this relation with more precision. Schleiermacher writes, quote, We are conscious of ourselves as absolutely dependent, or, which intends the same meaning as being in relation with God, end quote. The feeling of absolute dependence is not an emotion or some kind of subjective feeling in the ordinary sense of the term. Instead, it is a specialized term used with intention to indicate our being ex existentially grounded and dependent upon God absolutely as the wince of our existence. Um, it is Schleiermacher's way of suggesting that to be human is to be dependent upon God, to be God's creatures. Essential, essential to our very existence as human beings is this precognitive, intuitive, uh, intuitive perception or feeling that we did not determine our own existence and thus we depend absolutely on God as the wince of our being. Schleiermacher explains, quote, so present in every instance of self-consciousness are two features, a being positioned as a self and a not having been positioned as such, so to speak, or a being and a somehow having come to be. Thus, for every instance of self-consciousness, something other than one's I is presupposed. Something whence its determinate, its determinate ex nature exists, and without which a given self-consciousness would not be precisely what it is. And so that's Schleiermacher's kind of technical definition, but he says the um, same thing I'm saying up above. Um, so I'll continue reading. The feeling of absolute dependence or God consciousness is defined clearly in contrast with self-consciousness and world consciousness. In these other relations, we feel at once relatively free and relatively, dependence, relatively dependent. For example, we can have an effect on the world just as we can be affected by it. 
We are, det we are dependent upon the world, but we are also free in relation to it. So we can now recognize why our being in relation with God, our God consciousness, is a feeling of absolute dependence. We are affected absolutely by God as the wince of our being, and we cannot affect God or cease to be dependent upon God. We did not establish this relation, and we cannot escape it. We have no feeling of freedom in relation to God, and this is what contrasts God consciousness with self and world consciousness. Dogmatics is a scientific reflection on the feeling of absolute dependence, or simply, on our existential being in relation with God. In other words, theology is faith-seeking understanding, a particular kind of knowledge that arises from the existential relationship of faith, namely, communion with God in and through Jesus Christ. It is an empirical science with a historical basis in the life of the church, and so theology is bound to the collective experience of, rede of redemption in the church of Jesus Christ. With this, with, with this, this, in case of water. <laughs> with this, Schleiermacher establishes his conviction that proper dogmatics belongs within the limits of piety alone. <clears throat> the piety alone. Dogmatics is not empty, abstract speculation, but a reflection on that highest state of self-consciousness, the feeling of absolute dependence. If we, if we remove the density of this expression, then his proposal is actually, actually quite simple. Dogmatics is a reflection on our being in relation with God, faith-seeking understanding. Cool, I'll stop there. <clears throat> so that's the beginning of this chapter. So obviously I go into more detail throughout the chapter, um, working out precisely what Schleiermacher means by some of these terms. But I think really the most important, important kind of thought to take from, from that um, is that feeling, when Schleiermacher refers to feeling, perception, intuition, um, he's not speaking of that in the t common way that we speak of these terms. So feeling is a very um, specialized, it's a technical term for Schleiermacher, and so it's not something that he's trying to refer to what we commonly talk to as these fleeting emotions, something that's subjective, something that begins in ourselves. Feeling of absolute dependence connotates a relationship that we are not the authors of, a relationship that is um, really grace-based. So one of the big themes that I tried to emphasize throughout the book was that Schleiermacher is preeminently a theologian of grace. The grace of God is so um, um, permeating his, his work, it's hard to really ignore it without having superficial readings. And so Schleiermacher, grace was a central thing for his theology. And to kind of overlook that and just read him and take one, this one term that just happens to be important for him, but it's not the most important aspect of his theology. Um, but to take this one term and to use this and to say that this is the key to unlocking all the Schleiermacher is simply wrong. Um, and so I think we would have a much better understanding of his work, a more charitable understanding of Schleiermacher's work, as soon as we begin to recognize that the doctrine of grace is such an important aspect of his theology. Um, and so in the book, I practically do that by beginning with his doctrine of election, which in its own right, Schleiermacher has, um, his doctrine of election is a important contribution. Um, but in, in a broader sense, um, I did that just to kind of orient our thinking with the idea that this controversy is eventually going to come up. And so that's why I started the book there. But um, that's probably the most important thing I can think of to kind of shift our thinking to a proper understanding about Schleiermacher, especially given the fact that all of these misreadings go around his work. And so kind of returning that back to the feeling of absolute dependence, that means that feeling is not a term that is subjective, but it truly is something that arises as, as the result of God's grace. And so it's not something that comes from ourself. It's not self-grounded. It's God-grounded, ground, grounded in, in the um, wince of our existence. That's a term Schleiermacher likes to use to refer to um, God, and, and particularly in our relationship to, um, to God. And so um, that's why I found it the easiest way to think about the feeling of absolute dependence is to bring it back to, firstly, to grace, and then secondly, to bring it back to a relational metaphor. And that's what it is. It, it, it is somewhat like a relational metaphor where it is a description of our relation to God. Um, and so it's a relation that we do not instigate, but one that we are participating in. And so understanding it with those two kind of things in mind, um, it's, it's a very complicated 
term in overall and you know entire books could be written just about that term and they have been written just about the term um but we will kind of be at a place where we can better understand Schleiermacher and what he meant by it um when we kind of keep those things in mind um and so i think i think um uh, one of the good things i hope to achieve in the book is to really kind of offer that new perspective about the controversial um, feeling of absolute dependence and to um, open up new avenues for thought. Um, obviously, there's so much more in the book than just talking about that. That's the fourth chapter. That's It is the longest chapter where I deal with it. Um, but I also talk about things like um, Schleiermacher's Christology, which has actually been more influential than I expected it to be. Um, it was a really interesting study to learn about that. I ended up discovering that Pannenberg and a lot of other these guys kind of was influenced by Schleiermacher's Christology, particularly his critique of traditional Christology. Um, I also talked about like his doctrine of the Trinity. Um, Schleiermacher is often considered to be an anti-Trinitarian or a, um, somebody that at least disregarded the Trinity. Um, I worked very hard in um, trying to overcome that as well and so really a lot of what i was doing in the book was combating against all these just misconceptions and trying to kind of let schleiermacher um be seen in a new positive light um so yeah anyways that's about the um the gist of that and that's all i had in terms of reading um from the book um i know one person wrote me a message before that they would like me to talk about bard's critique and whether or not he was correct um, I think by now I've somewhat answered that question. Um, I do not think Bart was accurate in his critique. I do think that he wished that he could be at one. He does wish that he could be closer to Schleiermacher than he was um, in terms of um, wanting to be. He, he, he greatly, greatly respected Schleiermacher. And, um, but in terms of the actual um, outworkings of his critique I don't think he was correct and most modern Schleiermacher scholars pretty much all, well, all of the ones I read think that Bart was wrong and then a really good amount of Bart scholars are coming around to the opinion that okay maybe Bart wasn't right about Schleiermacher um, but yeah anyway so that answers um, John had that question so I hopefully answered that by reading some from the book um, so there's one comment here Oh, thank you, Tara. That was very nice. Um, nice. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, Schleiermacher's definitely, definitely been influential in, in the history of ideas, and so I hope to recapture some of his, um, his impact. Um, so yeah, if there's any other questions, feel free to let them in now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I'll obviously be able to answer the comments just in, um, just typing them out, but. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm really, like I talked about at the beginning, I, I am proud of this book. I feel like it, it um, it's really the best thing I've done so far. It took me longer than I typically like to do for books, but it was just a lot of research and a lot, um, a lot more work, really. And so it was really great to be able to put in that effort, and I think it paid off. Um, Schaller Marker is certainly difficult, but I was really happy to, um, to be able to kind of come to grips with them and now I, I feel like I have another theological friend somebody that I can turn to and, and um, I, I know I'll return to his work eventually and I know I am not done with Schleiermacher and I'd like to do more with him potentially write more about him um, but we'll see how all that goes um, but yeah like I said Schleiermacher in plain English is the book there's another shot of it um, I put links in the uh, description above of where you can get it UK US on my website, all of that stuff. Um, but thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, I really hope the book is helpful for those of you who've read it or are going to read it. Hopefully it's helpful for you as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. And as always, I appreciate the support. And um, you guys are great. Have a great rest of your night or day or whatever it is for you. Take care. Bye.